Welcome everyone to our last short devotion on Psalm 139 under the general title of What is God Like? My name is Victor Jack and I'm one of the helpers at the Wesley Community Church here in Bury St Edmunds. In our previous four talks we sought to answer the question what is God like? While there are many different ways in which you could approach this we've restricted our thoughts to Psalm 139 which has given us an amazing insight into what God is like and how he operates in our lives. In one sense it's been quite disturbing if we've been doing what is wrong in God's sight but on the other hand it's also reassuring to discover that God knows all there is to know about us. So far we've stood back in amazement at God's incredible knowledge. He knows our daily actions, he knows our hidden thoughts, he even knows our unspoken words. We've discovered too that there's nowhere in the universe where we can hide, where we can escape his presence. Whether we go up to the heavens or down to the depths of the sea or travel to the furthest corner of the earth. In our last talk it was wonderful to realize that God was intricately involved in our conception and our development in our mother's womb. And it was no wonder that David stood back in awe as he wrote, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! When I awake, I am still with you. That final phrase is fascinating. What is David saying when he writes, When I awake, I am still with you? Is he saying that when I get out of bed in the morning, you're right there with me, you'll be by my side, whether I sleep or whether I'm awake? Or is David saying, when I awake from the sleep of death, I will be in your eternal presence? Either way, both are wonderfully true. Death is often likened to sleep in the Bible. And when we die, we fall asleep in this life. But then, if we trust in God, we wake up immediately in his presence in the next life. And God is with us every day, and he waits to welcome us into his eternal home. Now in this psalm, there's a sudden and unexpected change of focus. In the next few verses, we'll see David's tone completely changes, and he expresses some really strong reactions to the evil people who are around him. So let me read a few verses to you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. David in this psalm seems to have moved from a mood of thoughtfulness and wonder in his devotion to God to feelings of anger and resentment towards the wicked people around him. He's woken up to the dawn of a new day after the great blessing of worshipping God. He knows he now has to face evil and wicked men around him, people who resent and hate God, who don't have the same reverence and devotion to God that he has. So the contrast is very marked in his emotions, moving from wonder and worship to anger and resentment. Take, for example, the huge blessing you receive when you go away for a weekend at Sizewell Hall, our conference centre on the East Coast. You meet with God and you experience a fresh touch of his spirit upon your life. You return home on Sunday night on cloud nine. Then Monday morning, you go off to work. And like David, you have to face up to the greed and selfishness around you, the corruption and the violence that's in our society. David's reactions in these verses seem harsh and forgiving at first, and yet they're completely understandable. He finds it offensive. He finds it outrageous that some of the people he knows, and I quote, speak of God with evil intent. They misuse his name. They hate God. They rise up against God. And David is deeply hurt that the God he loves and worships should be treated with such ignorance and such irreverence. We might think David is expressing feelings of personal anger and revenge when he cries out to God, If only you would slay the wicked, O God. But David's wounded feelings speak of his righteous anger. 
while some of us perhaps might be more inclined to be less concerned or even more tolerant. Do we ought not to have similar feelings to David of righteous indignation when we hear of those who make illegal arms and ammunition that maim and wound and kill innocent people? Or think of those behind the huge financial business of pornography that exploits the sexually weak and the sexually sick. Or think of those involved in peddling drugs through country lines that prey on young and vulnerable people and send them to an early death. Or there are those who are trafficking young people for sexual purposes and leave them physically and emotionally scarred for life. Thank God we have people today who feel as outraged as David did when they see the exploitation and the oppression of people in our world. And then we see them throwing themselves into rescuing and restoring bruised and broken people. And so we come to the end of the psalm and we might call it David's prayerful response. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You sense David knows he's not perfect. So he turns from the wickedness he sees around him to look into his own heart. And that's always a good thing for us to do when we're feeling judgmental towards other people. God has already searched him. In verse 1 he stated, You have searched me and you know me. God knows his heart completely. He knows all the sin and the wrong that is there. And God wants each one of us to be willing to pray this same prayer, to actually invite him to search our hearts. God desires to have a relationship with us, but first we need to repent so that he can cleanse us from every evil way that's in us and eventually lead us into a beautiful relationship with himself. Have you ever prayed this prayer and asked God to reveal to you what is in your heart? We need to know what he sees because we're very good at trying to bury out of sight the wrong things we have done. But the sins we bury are not hidden from God and they will always lead to a guilty conscience which destroys our sense of well-being and our peace of mind. Well, I've good news for you because there's a wonderful promise in the New Testament to help us. If before God we know we're sinful and need his forgiveness, then we can hold on to this promise. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the promise. If we confess our sins, knowing we haven't lived up to our own standards, let alone God's standards, then we can be sure of this. He is faithful. He will forgive us. He will keep his promise and he will welcome us into his wonderful family. So make David's prayer your prayer today and go on to experience the wonder of his forgiving love. So together, shall we make this our prayer as we close this series of studies? Let's bow our heads for a moment. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Father God, we thank you for this psalm that we've been privileged to study. May your word, the Bible, with its wonderful teaching, always control the way we think and the way in which we behave. We ask it for your greater glory. Amen. So thank you everyone for listening. If you prayed this prayer, then we would love to be able to help you in your journey of faith. So do get in touch with us. You'll find our details on the website or they will appear on the screen at the end of this talk. So may you be constantly blessed and encouraged as you go on reading God's wonderful word. Thank you. <laughs>